How did you get interested in cryptozoology? Well, I was always interested in monsters from a very young age. I was fascinated with horror movies. And uh, once I got one of those Strange But True books at the uh, Scholastic Reader when I was young, maybe in third grade, it uh, had a lot of mystery monsters in it, like Bigfoot, Loch Ness Monster, the Yeti. And I was immediately fascinated by these creatures. And later on, I saw uh, episodes of In Search Of, uh, Mysterious Monsters, things that came out in the 70s. So uh, from a very early age, I was just really fascinated with all these uh, type creatures. What was your first exposure to The Legend of Boggy Creek, and how do you feel about the film now? Do you think the film helped or hurt the cryptozoology field? My first exposure was back in the late 70s. For some crazy reason, my parents took me to the drive-in to see it when it came out. And it was big on the drive-in circuits back in the 70s, of course, uh, and played for many years, even though it was released in 72. Uh, it went on to play in theaters and drive-ins for years and years. So I don't real, really remember what age I was, but uh, when I saw it, it really caught my attention because I grew up as a hunter with my father and we had hunted throughout Texas and Arkansas. We camped in all the areas and been up through all the little rural towns. And so uh, being that I, you know, love monsters and love Bigfoot, when I saw the movie, I, I realized that, wow, that Bigfoot, you know, maybe closer than I think. It's not just some a uh, faraway place like British Columbia or wherever that is, you know, or the Pacific Northwest, that there was a creature that might exist here locally. So uh, that was that was my first, the first time I saw it, and I can remember bits and pieces of it uh, from that first showing, but of course later on I think I saw it on TV and, and got the VHS and went from there. Uh, I think the movie is very important to cryptozoology because a lot of the uh, prominent cryptozoologists today, prominent writers in this field, uh, Lauren, Lauren Coleman being a good example, uh, claims that this is one of the uh, deciding factors for him pursuing uh, this type of subject. And, you know, he saw that obviously when he was younger. Uh, there's many, many more uh, cryptozoologists that cite it as a big influence in their life. So I think for that reason, it kind of inspired people to go further and to look and to and, you know, like I said, to establish that Bigfoot creatures don't necessarily exist only in California and Washington, that they may exist all over, and that kind of fueled the fire for people to look in their own areas and get out in the woods. What intrigued you about the case that you decided to write a book about it? Well, you know, I think when you see something uh, at a very young age and it's just the right things line up, the right circumstances, right place, right time. I was interested in the subject and it just really, when it gripped me uh, right there from a young age, I was always fascinated with the movie. It just had a special place uh, to me. And as I you know, got older and, and now I, I write for a rumor horror magazine, I was looking for subjects to do articles on and I thought, man, you know, I always loved the legend of Boggy Creek and I always wondered, you know, what was true about it because the tagline was a true story, you know, and, and so, you know, I just set out to answer that question for myself and as I did the research and began to realize that there was a lot more to the story, there was a lot more that was true about that movie than most people realize, I thought, man, this, this isn't just something that would make a good article, this would in fact make a great book. And so, I mean, really, I couldn't believe nobody had written a book on it yet. You know, it's, it's mentioned in various places and other uh, referenced in other Sasquatch books, but uh, nobody had really done a definitive uh, chronological history of everything that went on from the history of the creature to the making of the movie to the sightings which occur even up to today. So it was really the perfect book for me, uh, my, my favorite subject, you know, my favorite movie. And uh, it was really a great experience to research and write this, and uh, it, it's turned out great. In your research and writing the book, how did the people who claim to have seen and interacted with the creature feel about the movie's portrayal of events? Well, you know, like anything, in the town of Falk, a lot of people, you know, dismiss the whole thing or, you know, have a good time with it. Uh, then you have a lot of people who put a lot of stock in it and think there really is something to this and there could possibly be a creature 
uh, flesh and blood creature that's behind all this. So you have some people who felt that the movie was a good thing for the town, and you had people that thought it was bad. I mean, the, being that it's a small town and now you have a famous monster associated with it, you know, people were running all over the place down there, trespassing, uh, knocking over fences. So it was uh, a real problem, and in some cases a financial problem for people. So naturally those people don't feel like the movie was a great thing. But, you know, as you look back in history, a lot of people have made good on it and made the best out of it, uh, sold souvenirs or they're proud of it. They have a Boggy Creek uh, Festival there every once in a while. Uh, the Monster Mart, a little store down there, has a little uh, section where they have a tribute to the Falk Monster. They still sell souvenirs. So, you know, people like that, they love the movie. They like the movie and they, they think it's a good thing for the town of Falk and still do. So, you know, uh, there's various opinions on that, but of course, to any outsiders or people like me who've loved the movie, of course, it's 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 much bigger than uh, maybe they feel like being that they live there, you know. Why do you think that the idea of Bigfoot, whether he exists or not, is such a cultural touchstone? I think I think the reason that Bigfoot really fascinates and, and grabs people's imaginations is because the descriptions describe it as a man-like creature. We can identify with that and it, it's it's something in us that sees that as, as very intriguing and almost frightening that there could be something that may have a similar intelligence that you know walks upright on two legs like us you know because no other animals do that and so this is an exception to all other cryptids out there because, you know, chupacabra has four legs. It's like a dog. You know, we're familiar with dogs. Uh, lake monsters, you know, they're, they're fish of some sort, serpents. Uh, but, but in the case of Bigfoot, it's a lot, it's a lot closer to home. And if you look back throughout history, there's always been uh, legends and lore of, of hairy wild men or these, you know, hairy man as the Native Americans call it. So there's just always been something about that that's been fascinating. And I think Bigfoot, uh, no matter how old it gets or how many times we see it or, or what new shows come on, it's still going to fascinate a new generation and Bigfoot will just live on and on uh, even if it's never discovered or proven to be real.